Good morning and good afternoon for some of you uh, on the eastern side of the continent. Welcome to Beyond Compliance. Uh, today, today we got a great guest speaker and we're working on understanding the very real costs associated with poor quality and what we can do about it in our plans. My name is Aaron Bolshaw with Safety Chain Software and uh, today's Beyond Compliance. Um, we, we really just, the cost of quality, we've been tackling this uh, periodically, but we brought in somebody that's an absolute expert, so I'm really excited to have him here. Um, for those joining us for the first time, uh, Beyond Compliance is a periodic industry update for process manufacturers. The goal, pretty easy, bring you guys insights around the market that shape the way you grow our businesses, deliver quality products to customers, and of course, safeguard our brands while improving yields and continually uh, producing more, right? Uh, so the webinar sponsor is Safety Chain, the number one plant management platform trusted by over 1,500 manufacturing facilities to improve yield, maximize productivity, ensure compliance. Uh, so we help understand how it all works behind the scene, data, data automation, all that good stuff. But we're scheduled for about an hour today. We're going to keep it flexible. We've got a ton of great information uh, to go through. But first, just want to make sure everyone understands we can't hear you but we do want to hear from you. So uh, if you have any questions, please use the chat console uh, or the, excuse me, the question console and the uh, webinar console on the right of your screen. Um, if you're having any uh, uh, problems hearing, sometimes dialing in does help that uh, resolve that. So um, with that, very quickly, want to introduce our presenter. Bill Levinson is the principal consultant at Levinson Productivity Systems. And uh, beyond having a lot of acronyms after his name and a lot of certifications, <laughs> uh, Bill specializes in quality management systems, industrial stat uh, statistics, and lean manufacturing. But it's a lot more than that. He's a co-author, uh, the expanded and annotated My Life and Work, Henry Ford's Universal Code for World Class Success. Um, and then, yeah, ISOs, uh, he, he knows his way all the way around ISOs, CAP, RCAs, basically anything about advanced quality planning and statistical methods um, like SPC and so forth, he is an expert in. So, um, Bill, welcome today. Good morning and thank you for coming. Uh, this is, um, let's see. So, so yeah, you're man. a student of, of history. We, we, we've been working on this a little bit, right, Bill? And I love your, your passion for history. And you know what we've all learned through, you know, through time. To We have to increase productivity in all manner of ways. We were just talking about the Aztecs before coming live, right? And how all of these um, civilizations had one thread in common, which is we all try to do something a little better, make it easier on our workers, make it produce a little bit more as a process, right? So, and one of these points, and one of these things we have to have a good understanding is the cost of quality, which, you know, Bill, if, un if kept unchecked, it can really eat into your profits, right? Yeah, the cost, we're going to see the cost of quality can be, eat up a substantial amount of profit, and there are other wastes not even related to poor quality. Poor quality is the only one of the Toyota production system's seven wastes that announces its presence and has had the focus of the quality profession probably for a hundred years. Uh, there's other forms of poor quality that can can eat up like 90% of, of a job's productivity and productive output. And, Amazing. We're going to see an example later of uh, Little Leaf Farms, I believe, which eliminates another source of waste that's not related to poor quality, but otherwise would waste a lot of the farm workers' labor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got a really good lineup. So why don't you take us through, Bill, the learning objectives and, and get us going about the staggering cost of poor quality and how to fix it. Okay. The uh, learning objectives are know why the cost of quality analysis is, is important, and the Automotive Industry Action Group has an excellent reference for that, which I'm going to cite later. Okay, I know it's automotive and not agriculture, but actually a lot of what they do is applicable to many other industries, and they have some very valuable resources that can be applied to all industries. Next, uh, recognize how Benjamin Franklin's principles apply not only to cost of poor quality, but to other wastes. Uh, Franklin was a major influence on Henry Ford's thought process, and Henry Ford created 
Well, it's now known as the Toyota production system, but Taiichi Ono, the father of the Toyota production system, says openly that he got his ideas from Ford. And if you look at the books written by Henry Ford, he's talking about just-in-time manufacturing as but one example and things that we associate with the Toyota production system. And that, and Ford in turn cited Benjamin Franklin as an influence. Uh, also recognized the asymptomatic nature of six of the seven wastes. Uh, remember, poor quality is the only one that stands up and, and says, hey, we have a problem over here, come and get me. Uh, let's say you have defective product, maybe uh, a defective uh, shipment of food product or something like that. Yeah, somebody's going to notice that. Hopefully your internal quality system will notice that. And they're going to say, we have a problem, we have to fix it. These other wastes, because they don't cause any immediate problem, they can hide there for literally centuries. I'm not making that up. Uh, Bricklaying is practiced for thousands of years. It's one of our the human species' oldest trades. Wasted roughly two-thirds of the bricklayer's labor because the bricklayer had to bend over to pick up each brick. And Frank Gilbreth, the father of motion efficiency, brought in a uh, scaffold to deliver the bricks at waste level. All of a sudden, they could work three times as quickly and with less physical effort. So that underscores how these other wastes can hide in plain view. Right. Um, okay, apply the concept of hidden plant uh, resources that exist solely to address the cost of poor quality like customer complaint departments, for example, that that's there to address the cost of poor quality and we're paying for it. And if we didn't have as much poor quality, we wouldn't have to pay for a customer complaint department. Mm -hmm. uh, recognize the effect of what General Carl von Clausewitz called friction, uh, which are seemingly minor but chronic waste, uh, which affects organizational performance. If workers encounter something in their daily work they find inconvenient or they have to work around or fix every day, that's undermining organizational performance. And the reason it's allowed to persist is the workers get used to working around it and fixing it. And they, ne they never uh, think to complain about it. The Automotive Industry Action Group Manual is CQI 22 Cost of Poor Quality Guide, which shows how to quantify the cost of poor quality. And finally, use Henry Ford's four key performance indicators to empower the entire workforce to identify all forms of waste. And remember, we know that what Ford did work. He built one of the most profitable industries ever to exist. I think he was a self-made billionaire, and that was back in the 1910s, 1920s, when a billion dollars was an almost an inconceivable amount of money, and he was paying higher wages in the, pro in the process. He was sharing all this with his workers and making cars affordable to the middle class. So we know that what he did worked and I'm going to show you how to make it work again today. Sounds good. And Bill, you should have control over the screen now. If you go uh, left and right, or if you'd like, you can help uh, ask me to. But you should be able to uh, click there now. I know there's a little delay on here. Yeah, why don't you try and click the screen? There we go. Uh, OK, that, that works. Okay, why perform a cost of quality analysis? Okay, we saw the, vul the vulnerability of complex international supply chains during the COVID-19 epidemic when the, when the epidemic actually disabled a lot of manufacturers and transportation systems and we found suddenly we couldn't get what we needed to run our own factories. And of course, there were the infamous shortages of toilet paper and even worse shortages of personal protective equipment. And even worse, uh, mainland China threatened 
to disrupt our supply chains. Uh, they threatened in 2019 to withhold rare earths that go into our electrical vehicles, and they threatened openly in 2020 to uh, cut off medical uh, medications and medical intermediates. Uh, and the, the references for that are given in the handout, uh, like China threatens to limit rare earth exports and warning over trade war, and they threaten to halt supply of medicine amid coronavirus. So reduction of domestic costs, including but not limited to costs of poor quality, will support and engage reshoring of American manufacturing. Uh, the issue, the connection between poor quality and offshoring is uh, people have probably gotten used to the idea that if they use cheap offshore labor, uh, they don't have to worry about waste because you're not paying much for the labor. Whereas if you're using high-wage domestic workers, then you have to make sure that each worker is working to the maximum of his or her productivity, and that means making the jobs efficient and removing waste from the jobs. So there's also a tie-in with our economic security here. IATF 16949 is the automotive standard that corresponds to ISO 9001. It's for quality management systems. And again, it's automotive, but this standard actually covers a lot of stuff that ISO 9001 does not, and it applies across the board to almost any imaginable industry. Now, the automotive-specific items, maybe not, but there's other considerations such as cost of quality analysis that do. Uh, the automotive industry is very sensitive to this. They don't want to pay for poor quality. Uh, in other words, if the supplier has costs of poor quality built into the price of whatever it's selling, the, the automakers don't want to pay for that poor quality. So that's a requirement under that system. The, the manual ads, the, that's the cost of poor quality guide is CQI 22, adds that the cost of poor quality wastes 25 to 35 percent of the typical operating budget. And these costs include opportunity costs which is uh, those costs are invisible to the cost accounting system because we can't write off on the tax return uh, revenue that we don't realize because we didn't do something. Essentially, it's an error of omission, totally invisible to the cost accounting system. An enormous amount of waste, uh, Muda is Japanese for waste, and it pervades many organizations to the extent it can exceed 50% of the operating budget. And again, these wastes go beyond the cost of poor quality. I mentioned Gilbreth's non-stooping scaffold that proved that bricklaying is practiced for hundreds of years, wasted about 64% of the worker's labor by forcing him to bend over, uh, pick up a brick, stand up, put the brick into the wall, and so on. So you can imagine that these workers, even though they work very hard and bricklaying is a skilled trade, they probably weren't paid very well. They went home pretty exhausted at the end of the day from having to stand up and bend over a thousand times during an eight hour day. Uh, the customers were paying too much for the construction and the contractor wasn't getting much profit all because of this waste. There is another example where a simple fabric folding operation wasted 50% of the worker's labor just due to a poor workplace layout. They didn't have to spend anything to fix it. They just rearranged the workplace a little. All of a sudden, everybody is twice as productive. I mentioned Ben Franklin's influence uh, this is from about 250 years ago or thereabouts. He says, spend less than, spend less than you get, uh, essentially eliminate, eliminating waste. Uh, this is a, a it actually wasn't a penny saved as a penny earned. It's a penny saved 
is two pence clear. And the example given in modern applications is it may take an additional $10 in sales to realize an additional dollar in profit. However, if we reduce our expenses by a dollar, that has exactly the same effect and we don't have to expand our sales to get it. Uh, here as an example, uh, suppose uh, treat this as a coin where the customer is paying this coin in exchange for what the customer believes is value, and the customer is paying $10 to cover $3 in wages, a dollar in profit, and $6 in waste. Now, one reason they ship jobs offshore is they say, well, if we, if we can reduce wages, we can increase profits and reduce the price. Uh, however, if we look at the coin on the right side of the screen, we've re removed a lot of waste. So the customer is only paying $8 to cover $4 in wages and $2 in profits. So the customer is paying less. The employer is getting more profit and the workers are getting higher wages. So everybody is better off. There is no need to increase sales, although because we can reduce the price from $10 to $8, we probably will increase sales in the bargain. And then, of course, if we can get rid of the rest of the waste, we can reduce the price even further, raise wages even more, and also realize higher profits in the bargain. And this is pretty much the underlying principle here of what we're trying to do. Here's the uh, correspondence between Franklin and Henry Ford, who cited Franklin as an influence. Uh, Ford mentioned uh, waste of time, uh, because, and he also says uh, wasted time doesn't litter the shop floor like wasted material. In other words, if workers have to wait or walk to, to get things and move things, that's wasted time. But because the job gets done, uh, it'll stand there in plain view for years, and nobody will think to do uh, anything about it unless you know what to look for. Namely, that if you see people having to wait because because there is no work for them, or or uh, having to walk around to get to get things and move things, uh, then then that's actually wasted re wasted time resources. Uh, Goldratt's theory of constraint uh, said time lost at the constraint is lost forever. In other words, if you have an operation that can make only 100 parts an hour and you need 100 parts an hour and for some reason that operation stops and you lose an hour's worth of productivity because that's the constraint operation, you've lost 100 units of production and there's no way to replace them, and the cost of that is the opportunity cost of selling them. In other words, it's the profit we would have made by making and selling those 100 parts. Uh, cycle time does not add value. Uh, the references for all these are given, in the, uh, are given in the handout, by the way. It includes not just the slides, but also the notes that go with the slides. Getting back to the AIAG manual, uh, CQI 22 says the cost of poor quality multiplies often by orders of magnitude when non-conforming work escapes its point of origin to become an input for downstream processes. It's the old thing about uh, for want of a nail, a uh, simple fastener probably doesn't cost very much money at all, but if the nail is defective, and it goes into something more complicated and the more complex part is unacceptable as a result, it can cost an enormous amount of money. As a matter of fact, a historical example of that was what sank the Titanic. Well, of course, the iceberg played a major role in that, but they also found out the, that the rivets, rivets are essentially what hold a ship together. They're fasteners like nails had too much slag in them and the rivets were non-conforming and they think that if the rivets had been up to standard 
the ship would not have sunk with the enormous loss of life uh, plus the loss of the ship. Uh, for example, suppose a food product has to be recalled because of consumer safety issue that was not detected or prevented prior to shipment, that can be enormously expensive. Only about 15% of problems are found at their points of origin, and the other 85% are therefore found further down the line where their consequences are more expensive. And there's an automotive principle, which of course applies to other industries as well, called don't make it, don't take it, don't make it, don't pass it along with it relating to poor quality. Uh, don't take it means uh, doesn't, don't accept non-conforming inputs. Uh, don't make it means don't produce poor quality and don't pass it along. For example, if you're working on a manufacturing operation, there might be an outgoing quality check on the work going out of your workstation that will tell you if something is non-conforming and in fact may actually shut the workstation down. They call that jidoka, which is Japanese for autonomation. And it comes from uh, looms run by the father of the founder of the Toyota, of Toyota, I believe, named Toyota with a D. He ran a weaving operation, and a, a broken thread will render uh, maybe dozens of yards of fabric non-conforming. So these looms were designed to detect the broken threads and stop the loom to, protect, to prevent generation of non-conforming work and waste of material. So that's the uh, don't pass it along aspect. Yeah, and so we have a, a interesting um, case study. So Little Leaf Farms is a a customer of, of Safety Chain. So uh, full caveat there, but they've taken a a you know centuries old uh, process of of growing and harvesting uh, a crop and really turned it on its head. Many of us are very familiar with this, but they've got a really interesting way to do this. So they're tackling a lot of things um, about waste. Uh, and also uh, making it easier just for the production line. So instead of going out and planting in rows on the ground, um, seeds are planted in these gutters, okay? And they are on a conveyor belt. And they're conveyor belts. It's a fantastically um, modern facility. I mean, beyond belief, Bill. And, and every, all the plants get exactly what they need, the right uh, rainwater, obviously the sun, everything can get recycled, certainly on the water side, nutrients and so forth. But then it's still on that conveyor belt this whole time and it gets uh, brought over to the harvesting facility into one place so you know there's a lot of efficiencies going on here they just expanded they've got ten, uh, 10 acres of fresh lettuce under glass it's out in massachusetts it's wildly wildly well first of all it's very cool to, to see but they're able to do this and deliver super fresh so really high quality uh, to local grocery stores in 24 hours, right? So this is, what are some of the things you see in this kind of an operation, Bill, that, that are, are lending to, um, you know, reducing of uh, uh, inefficiencies and waste? There's uh, numerous advantages to this. And again, I mentioned that poor quality is only one of the seven wastes. Now on the traditional farm, you have fertilizer, a lot of which just uh, leaches off into the groundwater and can actually become an environmental product. So not only an environmental problem, not only is the farmer paying for fertilizer that essentially does nothing to grow the plants, it also can become an environmental problem. Uh, water, uh, if there is a water shortage like a dry season, uh, water goes into the ground and a lot of it go, continues down into the water table, doesn't do anything for the plants. Now, in this case, you have an enclosed system, so all the water that goes in is used for the plants. There's no waste of water, no runoff, any nutrients. Uh, they call that hydroponic farming, where they provide uh, balanced chemical nutrients for the plant. None of that goes into the ground. All of it is available to the plants. 
uh, insecticides are another issue. There uh, can be hazardous to people. Uh, you, people were told to wash their fruit before eating it in case there was insecticide on it. And of course, the farmer has to pay for that. Well, if you have an incl a totally enclosed system where, let's say, you can kill insects uh, before they come in or, or put up a screen that guarantees they can't come in, well, you don't need insecticides either. Uh, if you get a cold snap, there's all these stories about like a, a season's harvest of, I think, oranges can be ruined by a late cold snap. I don't know the details. I'm not in that line of business, but I have heard of entire harvests being ruined by drought or by cold, and you have an enclosed system here, so you're immune to that. Another advantage is that the workers do not have to bend over to pick the crops. It's the same thing that Frank Gilbreth did, but applied to agriculture as opposed to bricklaying, which means the workers can do a lot more. They can be paid higher wages, but the job costs a lot less, which again leads to lower prices and higher profits in the bargain. So this case study is very well worth studying to see what Little Leaf is doing and to and uh, to use them as an example. Yeah, they're uh, th they're very serious about quality and keeping their standards high. They understand that you know they th it's almost the 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 last bastion of profitability, which is if you can really produce high quality and show it and know that it's consistent. Um, that's that's your margin. It's an extre extremely good case study, and I'm looking forward to learning more about Little Leaf Farm myself. Okay, if we go back to the rule of tens, the, co the cost of poor quality can increase astronomically the further it gets into the process uh, due to cost of uh, line stoppages, reworks, and recalls. Product recalls, of course, can be very expensive and uh, seemingly minor components such as a rivet or a nail uh, or other fastener. They're also talking about counterfeit semiconductor products going into defense-related goods. Same thing, you put a, a, a bad semiconductor into an a, a aircraft that costs maybe $100 million. Uh, the, you probably won't have to scrap the entire airplane, but could probably lead to uh, well over a million dollars in rework. Plus, of course, if it's not detected, it can put life and safety at risk. So that underscores the importance of this. So process planning and process control should incorporate don't take it, don't make it, don't pass it along. Uh, modern technology such as automated, automated quality management systems with sensors, scales, and other metric gathering devices and the other uh, items shown there it's essential to detecting and stopping poor quality at its point of origin, or even better, stopping it from happening in the first place. Remember, poor quality is the only one of the seven wastes. It's the only waste that announces its presence uh, and says, uh, here I am, come and get me. And if you have a good corrective and preventive action system, you probably will come and get it pretty quickly. And eliminate the root causes, which, uh, while, while it's the most obvious of the wastes, it's uh, the fact that it stands up and announces its presence maybe makes it the least important waste unless it gets through to affect a customer as previously described, then it's extremely dangerous. And the others don't do anything to tell us they're there. They're often more costly than poor quality. And they're usually built into the job, which means they're present 100% of the time. Uh, this, I don't think this, this is actually a video, but I don't think it plays in this particular software. Uh, this is sufficiently old to be in the public domain. It's over 100 years old probably closer to 120 years old. They did have movies in those days. They were silent movies. And Frank Gilbreth used uh, movie film to show bricklayers uh, laying bricks 
and what the video shows is the the man in the front bends over picks up a brick i think maybe even bends over twice maybe wants to get the mortar and wants to get the brick and then puts it into the wall and this was taken for granted for hundreds of years when the bricks were delivered at waste level the productivity increased almost almost threefold they could lay three times as many bricks and uh, less effort. Let me, something just happened there. Let me go back to full screen here. Are you seeing it still? There we go. Okay, there it is. So if we get to other wastes, uh, muta, remember, is Japanese for waste and friction, as Clausewitz's term. So the cost of any material or energy that goes into a process and doesn't come out as a saleable product is waste. And for example, Little Leaf Farm takes care of that in terms of uh, nutrients for the plants, water. Uh, remember, on a, a traditional farm, the wa most of the water that goes in uh, goes into the groundwater, into the water table. Uh, a lot of the fertilizers, as I understand, uh, they, they complained about runoff of fertilizer, which represents wasted fertilizer the farmer has paid for and is not doing anybody any good. So that's waste. Uh, Clausewitz talks about countless minor incidents that lower the level of performance, and the Automotive Industry Action Group Manual on the Cost of Poor Quality cites seemingly small problems that harm bottom line performance. So the CQI 22 document is essentially saying the same thing that General von Clausewitz said back in 1831 in the military uh, application. Uh, restatements of Clausewitz, the first one is from J.F. Halpin's Zero Defects, written in 1966. The worker, uh, the worker doesn't like them. The worker has to work around them or fix them on a daily or maybe even hourly basis, but because the job gets done, nobody thinks to say anything about it or fix the problem. Hmm. The second one is from Henry Ford, a book written in 1930 called Moving Forward. So Ford is restating the same principle, and the reason his company was so successful was the workers understood that if there was something they had to work around or fix on a daily basis, they should go to a supervisor or maybe even figure out how to correct the problem itself themselves. So it didn't, it didn't continue to happen. Uh, this is what Clausewitz said in the context of military operations. He talked, for example, about rain uh, delaying soldiers or equipment so they don't arrive when they're supposed to arrive. That was one of the examples he gave. We have the same problems in logistics systems today where uh, let's say there's a storm or something and the, the truck can't reach your, your plant or can't take your product to your customer. Uh, that, that's another, that's the uh, same issue. Uh, Halp and Ford and the Automotive Industry Action Group applied the same principle to industry, uh, all talking about the seemingly minor efficiencies and chronic annoyances that accumulate to take money directly from the bottom line. Remember what Franklin said, uh, money saved, money not spent on waste, uh, goes directly to the bottom line. Uh, you don't have to increase sales to benefit from it. So teach this concept to your workforce and other relevant interested parties to help them identify friction. And there's the takeaway. We have to look at all seven ways to suppose just poor quality. Yeah. Traditional costs of quality are cost of preventing the poor quality. Cost of appraisal is like inspection, detecting the poor quality before it goes to a customer cost of internal failure, such as rework or scrap. Uh, maybe we find some non-conforming food before it leaves the farm and we have to throw it away. That's a cost of internal failure. Cost of external failure would be the cost of a product recall, uh, which uh, of course is going to be 
a lot worse. Uh, here's how the the, CQ, the CQI 22 manual accounts for the cost of quality. They use different ways of doing it. Uh, the whole account method uses accounting data related to poor quality, such as cost of warranty, scrap, and also related overtime labor and downtime costs. So like if you have to pay overtime labor to replace the non-conforming items, that, also, that would be a cost of poor quality. What's extremely dangerous is some organizations actually budget for poor quality, which uh, in other words is saying we're, we're willing to tolerate a certain amount of poor quality, then because we budgeted for it, we aren't gonna worry about it and it's allowed to stand there in plain view harming our, our overall performance because it's in the budget. A drawback of this system, and this is my opinion, it's not in the manual, it's that opportunity costs are totally invisible to cost accounting systems. Uh, cost accounting systems are designed for exactly two purposes. Uh, filing income statements, for example, you have to, if you're incorporated, you have to file with the Securities and Exchange Commission, at least if you're publicly traded, you have to file these reports with the SEC and, of course, tax returns. Uh, your, co your costs are deductible. But let's say we forego an opportunity that could, say, triple our profit. We can't write off the profit we didn't make as a cost, so that's going to be totally invisible to the cost accounting system. Caveat regarding all accounting costs, as I, this is what I said, they're for the IRS and the SEC. Uh, also, even labor, it's treated as a variable cost, but basically we're paying for people to be there eight hours a day regardless of whether we use them for eight hours or not. So essentially that's a fixed cost. Uh, the only time it becomes really a variable cost is if we're paying overtime, then yes, we can turn it on and off. So it's a variable cost. Uh, same thing for machine time unless there's no excess capacity. Overhead. A lot of places, like they assign a certain amount of overhead to every dollar of labor. That's another incentive for offshoring. Say if we, we uh, assign, say, 300% of the labor of the wages as overhead, then we're, we're showing the labor to be like 400 times, or sorry, four times as expensive as, as it is, and we can get rid of it by offshoring it. Well, the truth of the matter is the, the overhead is there regardless of what we do. Uh, maybe on paper for the accounting system, it's somehow variable, but the truth is it's not. And it's not counted towards the cost of poor quality unless it includes hidden plant that, uh, that can be removed. And Henry Ford told his managers and foremen to not pay any attention whatsoever to overhead because there was nothing they could do about it. So the accounting system can be extremely dangerous if we rely on it for everyday decision making. What we should use is engineering or managerial economics. Managerial revenue, sorry, marginal revenue is the income from selling an additional unit. Essentially it's like in differential calculus where the derivative is the uh, differential change from, from a from a tiny increment. So the, the marginal revenue is the, the income from selling one additional unit. The marginal cost is the cost of making the unit in question. And it's generally equal to the cost of materials and energy only unless overtime is being paid. Remember, we're paying, for, we're paying the workers regardless of whether they're making anything or not. The marginal profit is simply the difference between the two. Ford said of these opportunity costs that if a device would save 10%, then its absence is a 10% tax, and this tax is invisible to cost accounting. And remember that the one it, it took one 125th of an hour to lay a brick when people had to bend over to do it. 
as opposed to the achievable one three hundred fifty hour of a brick using the non stooping scaffold was probably the standard labor cost for Gilbreth's uh for Gilbreth bricklaying or so essentially the absence of the non stooping scaffold was roughly a sixty a sixty four percent tax on the labor simply because of something that wasn't there that would have helped. The whole person method, this is, this is going back to CQI 22, quantifies the full-time equivalent employees uh, who are responsible for dealing with poor quality, and these employees are the human counterparts of hidden plant. Remember, your customer complaint department is there because of poor quality. So if we got rid of the poor quality, we could probably have those people being doing something else like in making more items to sell rather than dealing with the consequence of poor quality. Hopefully I'm bringing this into a perspective that makes things we take for granted stand up and say, oh, this is a real, a real problem like cost of warranty service, uh, customer complaint handling, all that's cost of poor quality. Unit pricing uses cost accounting methods by calculating standard costs for undesirable events and so and multiplying them by the number of times the event take place. Again, however, standard accounting costs do not necessarily account for all the costs, especially opportunity costs. Uh, remember that example from Goldratt's theory of constraints that I gave, where if the, if the workstation can make 100 parts an hour, and maybe, maybe there's a, a demand for 120 parts an hour, and we only have capacity to make 100. We're going to we're going to sell every hundred we make. And if there's a, something stops that machine for an hour, we don't make 100 parts. And the cost accounting system, I'm, I'm not even sure if the cost accounting system would reflect that as a cost of poor quality. Well, let's say we have to rework 100 parts in that workstation rather than make saleable parts. So essentially the, the machine has to do the same job uh, twice. The cost accounting system will reflect the cost of the rework, maybe more material, uh, more time, but what it won't reflect is the revenue we didn't make from selling those 100 parts. So again, the cost accounting system doesn't tell us everything we need to know. A labor claiming method seeks to quantify the amount of time all employees spend on activities related to poor quality and finally deviation from ideal is a form of gap analysis that assesses the difference between actual performance and achievable performance. And achievable performance might, however, go beyond, well beyond an ideal of no non-conforming work, uh, no cost of poor quality. Remember the the uh, bricks, the brick laying example, maybe the walls were perfectly good quality and there was no cost of poor quality, but there was nonetheless an enormous amount of waste in their construction. Yeah, we wanted to kind of take, build the, the temperature in the room, if you will. We wanted to ask everyone a simple question. So what's going to happen here in just a moment is everyone's going to get a poll uh, on their on their screen. And we ask you to, to take take part in this poll, what that what best describes how you measure the cost of qual, uh, quality. Now, um, we're gonna launch that now and you're gonna see there's a few different answers you can choose. We, we don't want an exact method. We don't need you know details or anything like that. But Bill, what we're looking for is just understanding um, where people are at and how they measure cost of quality. One is we don't formally measure, right? There's some people, hey, there's some uh, factories that are just kind of, the, the demand is there and we're just getting enough out the door to, to meet demand. Maybe maybe you're looking for uh, a way to add COQ as a formal uh, key performance indicator, right? Um, a lot of us uh, work with consultants, you know, sometimes you're going to need Bill's help to kind of figure this out. Um, 
And then maybe you do, you know, I'd like to know how many people are using that ASQ formula, right? So we're going to let uh, this uh, poll uh, stand out there for just a few more seconds and, and then we'll close it. And we'll actually let everyone see, we're not taking anybody's names, but it's just going to be a, we're going to see, a, I think, a pie chart here in just a second. So uh, I'm going to close it here now and we're going to uh, uh, release this poll really quick. So there's a little bit of a, a gap between sharing and all right. All right. So, what do you what do you think of this? What's uh, any standout? Any takeaways here? Hmm. Looks like a uh, fifty fifty split. Yeah, uh, it's it's uh, <laughs> it's interesting. But I tell you what. So I. I I think uh, there's room. So my 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 thought process here is, if you've got a really well, um, in, I call it entrenched. Sometimes we call this it's not it hasn't been inspected in a while. Process, um, you will benefit from talking with a consultant, somebody like a Bill Levinson, right? So somebody that can say, wait a second, here's some opportunities that you don't see just because. And I can't remember if it was Ford who said this bill, but it was just the there. It's invisible because that's the way the process was built, right? Um, and then uh, it's kind of encouraging to see 25% of people using ASQ formula, so that's that's fantastic. Uh, we'll come back over here, and uh, we're speaking of KPIs, um, Bill. What, why don't you talk us through uh, Henry Ford? Okay. Oh, I've got to hide the results first. Oh, there, right? there we go. <laughs> Henry Ford had, had essentially four key performance indicators, and they're so simple, you can teach them to an, an entire workforce. Basically, waste of the time of things, which is cycle time. If work is standing around waiting, like if you see stuff waiting in the warehouse to go to the next operation, that's inventory which is proportional to wasted cycle time. Inventory is one of the seven wastes. Waste of the time of people. You can't pay somebody to walk. Uh, Ford said if, he, if somebody had to walk to a tool room uh, and wait for, for half an hour to get a part that cost 25 cents, and he was paying the people a dollar an hour, which back then the dollars were made of silver. That was a lot of money back then. He said, basically, that tool cost me 75 cents, 25 cents for the tool and 50 cents for the, the time uh, of the person that was wasted having to wait for it. Uh, basically, no job should require anybody to take more than one step in any direction or bend over. So if you see that in your workplace, a job that requires people to walk or to bend over as part of the job, that's an immediate sign that something should be done about what, about that. Waste of materials, I mentioned, for example, the farmer pays for fertilizer. If there's an, an, a runoff of fertilizer, it's an environmental problem, and it also represents a material the farmer paid for and got no benefit from. Uh, waste of energy is another one, <coughs> which ties in with carbon emissions, by the way, if the energy comes from fossil fuels, and even if it's renewable energy, if we're wasting energy, we're, made, we're wasting money. All seven TPS wastes can be expressed in these terms. Um, the, uh, to keep on schedule here, I'm not going to go into the details. This will be in the handout so you can see how, the, uh, how all seven Toyota production systems Toyota wastes can be expressed in these terms, and I believe these wastes also encompass even things the Toyota 7 wastes don't encompass. So I think Ford's key performance indicators are actually better than Toyota's because they encompass Toyota's and probably extend to things that Toyota's doesn't even cover. A waste of the waste of the time of things, cycle time. Uh, inventory is proportional to cycle time. Most cycle time in most organizations is non-value adding. Uh, setup and handling don't transform the product. Uh, transportation doesn't. 
Uh, even inspection might be necessary to ensure quality, but it doesn't uh, actually add value. And finally, weight is indeed a four-letter word, even though you can say it on the radio without getting into trouble. Hmm. So if workers see work waiting for a workstation or waiting for a forklift to move it to another part of the factory, should identify that as uh, an issue that adds to cycle time and adds to inventory. Inventory is money tied up that could be doing something else. People should not be paid to walk or for, to wait. Uh, suppose, uh, a lot of nurses complain even today just how tired they are from walking all day. So suppose the nurse has to walk uh, two hours out of every eight-hour shift, what really means is the person is getting six hours of real pay, but it's distributed so it looks like eight hours of pay and essentially a, a quarter of their working life is being thrown away on wasted motion. Uh, Ford back in 1920 designed the Henry and Ford, Henry and Clara Ford Hospital to minimize the amount of working that the nurse had to do. They're also complaining about agricultural wor workers, how little they're paid, uh, I think uh, minimum wage, uh, poor working conditions. Uh, all you have to do is look at some online videos of these agricultural workers doing their jobs. You see them bending over to pick crops, uh, carrying them to collection points. Well, that's why the wages are, are low, the prices are high, and the farmers are making less than they should all at the same time. Uh, nobody's benefiting from this. By the way, there's also videos of something for harvesting strawberries. It's a cart where the workers lie facing down and the essentially what the workers see, it's like an assembly line moving beneath them, except it's strawberries as opposed to widgets. And they reach down and pick the strawberries. They aren't bending over uh, to pick them. They aren't walking to carry them. They put them right into the into containers that are ready at hand and they can work much more quickly. Uh, some of them even come with canopies keep the sun off the workers, so you can imagine how much difference uh, that makes. See, we're on waste of materials. Uh, any material that goes into the process and doesn't come out and, and as something we can sell as waste, I mentioned like fertilizer and so on, which ties in, ISO 14000 was, is an environmental management system standards. However, uh, my own opinion is ISO 14001 is self-limiting. It says identify environmental aspects, and those are things we aren't allowed to dump into the environment uh, unless we want to get into trouble with the EPA. But the truth is, regardless of whether it's an environmental aspect, if we pay for it and then throw some of it away, we're throwing money away. Henry Ford, uh, there were no environmental laws in this time. He could have dumped into the nearest river, whatever wouldn't have gone up his smokestack without getting into trouble. But his position was, I paid for this stuff, and if I dump it somewhere, I'm, I'm uh, throwing my money away. Uh, Kingsford charcoal, by the way, is what happened to waste wood at the Ford company. He found a use for that wood. Uh, wood chemicals, charcoal, and he was actually able to sell uh, wood for which he had no further use. So a dollar not spent on wasted materials is a dollar of profit that can be shared with all the stakeholders. Uh, Shigeo Shingo paint parts, not air. There was a process where overspraying uh, wasted paint and created an environmental waste problem. Uh, so the, the fertilized crops, not groundwater, it's the same concept. Waste of energy, energy that doesn't transform the product is waste. Uh, hydraulic machine tools can be very wasteful. Uh, transportation of products that are mostly water, uh, this is why bottled tea is so expensive in the store. 
you're essentially paying to ship water around where you can buy bag tea or loose tea and get water out of your faucet, boil it, and make tea. So that's why it's so expensive. Money not spent on wasted energy flows to the bottom line. Cost of quality analytical techniques are a good start, but they're only a start because wastes not associated with poor quality are invisible to them. The seven wastes are more comprehensive, and I believe four of the ones that Henry Ford used are even more comprehensive than the Toyota production system wastes, and they're easier to understand. Okay, key takeaways from CQI 22, cost of poor quality. I'm not talking about the cost of these other wastes, just cost of poor quality by itself can waste 25 to 35% of the operating budget. We could otherwise put that money to other uses. Rule of tens, cost of poor quality increases enormously, if not caught at the point of origin. So let's say, suppose people are making something that seems rather unimportant like fasteners uh i'm trying to can't think of an agriculture co counterpart of that offhand uh, but some, something seemingly humble like a fastener if that isn't right the cost of poor quality can multiply enormously down the pike food product recalls are an example of that mm -hmm. I miss something. Okay, the rule of tens carries over directly into don't take it, don't make it, don't pass it along. Uh, don't take it is supported by successive check systems in which inputs are inspected for nonconformances. Uh, and this is usually automa automated because remember, inspection doesn't add value. If you have people who have to do the inspection, they're not adding value. This is usually automated. Don't make it. Is supported by error proofing and automation. Uh, don't pass it along. Is supported by self check systems that prevent the shipment of non conforming work. I'm trying to think of an error proofing in agriculture example. I think there's a uh, may, maybe a form of seed drill. I'm not 100% sure how it works, but basically it makes sure that the seed goes to the correct depth. Mm. The seed is supposed to go to a uniform depth, and it's designed to do that rather than relying on human judgment to get the seed at the correct depth. That would be an example of error proofing. Okay, asymptomatic waste. Remember, poor quality is the only one that stands up and tells us, uh, here I am, come and get me. And the other six are usually asymptomatic. They're built into the job, which makes them particularly destructive. They're there 100% of the time, often more costly than poor quality, and their bottom line financial effect is the same. Uh, money spent on waste comes directly from the bottom line, and it's why in a lot of jobs the workers complain that they're getting far too less pay. The employers are complaining that they're not making any profit, and the customers complain that they're being overcharged and all three of them are right and it's because of the waste in question. Numerous off-the-shelf techniques are available to quantify the cost of poor quality. Uh, CQI 22 I recommend very highly. Opportunity costs, however, are generally invisible to traditional cost accounting systems and can easily exceed the cost application of Ford's key performance in the key performance indices can force these wastes to become visible key performance indicators uh, waste of the time of things waste of the time of people waste of materials waste of energy Franklin's save and have is the best summary of the principles remember it may require ten dollars in marginal revenue or sales to generate the dollar in marginal profit. If we don't spend the dollar on waste, it has the same effect. Uh, advertising is the cost of sales, whereas lower prices that are driven by this principle are a negative. In other words, they're better than free cost of sales. OK, 
Hey, thank you for listening. I'll be happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you. So we do have a few coming in uh, from questions. Uh, let me open up this panel here. We, we're running out a little bit of time. However, um, one person was asking just very quickly about the invisibility of opportunity costs, understanding like how the, the question is, um, how do we um, present that or show that in, that opportunity cost? Um, the, it's kind of a long one, uh, Bill. So, but basically, it's uh, they want to they want to try to understand it more. How do you measure an invisible opportunity cost? Any uh, any thoughts there? It's uh, it basically it's simply the difference between w where we are and where we could be. A very simple example is there's there's an article on how how poor people are paid, and they had a video of someone using a mop to clean a huge warehouse or industrial floor space took me less than a second to realize why the pay is so low. Okay, maybe it takes 10 people uh, an eight hour day using mops to clean that floor and you're paying 10 people to push mops around so they're not being paid very much. However, you're paying 10 people so that job costs quite a bit. There's a floor cleaning machine, I believe costs $10,000, that will do the work of, four, of 10 people with mops, which means if you brought that machine in, the opportunity cost is the difference between what you're paying those 10 people with mops and what you would pay one, one person higher wages uh, than somebody with a mop, but you're only paying one person plus a $10,000 machine to do the same job. So essentially the like Ford said, if a device would save a certain amount of money and you don't have it, that's essentially a, a tax. And that would be one example of an opportunity cost. Uh, another one, the difference between how they harvested cotton by hand and they still do it in Uzbekistan, uh, the opportunity cost is even subsistence for a thousand manual laborers, uh, Uzbekistan uses essentially a tax in the form of labor, so it's supposedly unpaid labor, or maybe you're paying people very low wages to pick cotton by hand, and you're paying a thousand people to do it. Uh, I think John Deere and uh, I think Case International Harvester is the other one. They have these machines operated by one person that will harvest an acre of cotton in six minutes and do the work of a thousand hand laborers, the difference between the cost of the thousand hand laborers and one high wage worker with a, a machine, I think costs on the order of half a million dollars, but it still does the work of a thousand hand laborers. That would be an opportunity cost of not using that machine. Got uh, it. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it's, it really just kind of comes back to uh, painting the picture of return on investment sometimes, really just saying, hey, what's the, um, what, what does that future state possibly look like with the, you know, call it automation or machine or whatever you're looking at versus what it does now. And that's that, uh, that invisible cost. So that's fantastic. So we've, we've run out of time, Bill, but this has been fascinating. It's, uh, I've enjoyed uh, it immensely. I, uh, I love learning all of these things and, and I appreciate you taking time with us today at, at Beyond Compliance. Okay. Uh, but if people, have, you said there were a couple other questions, I'll be happy to stay over and answer them. I don't want, I don't want to uh, have anybody <laughs> go away with unanswered questions. We'll, we'll get those over to you. <laughs> Okay, yeah, yeah, if you want to send them to me by email, I'll get back with, uh, hopefully I can, I can help. That's absolutely what we'll do. That's absolutely what we do. And I appreciate that, uh, uh, that insistence on helping, Bill. You're very, uh, you're very generous with your time. Oh, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> All right, everyone, that, that'll wrap it up for Beyond Compliance. Again, uh, the staggering cost of uh, poor quality. Let's go make quality. That's what we do. So uh, we'll see you next time on Beyond Compliance. This is Aaron Bolshaw signing out for Safety Chain. Thanks again. Uh, once again, Bill Levinson. Thank you.